Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the State of the Ark podcast. My name is Mike. My name's Kason. Uh, we're going to be talking today about how to design a good tutorial, especially for complex games like RPGs. But first, we want to comment on the PlayStation Classic, which has the- dropped in price from $100 to $60. In like Almost. two weeks. When, when did it come out? Yeah. A couple weeks. It was in de- early December December 6th, I want to say. Wow. So, yeah, le- less than a month. <laughs> it's already dropped price, which is really, really a bad sign. That means... Like, holy cow. That means they didn't sell, like, any. See, and then contrast this with the SNES and NES Classic that sold out like crazy. People were selling them, buying them, and selling them for an inflated price online, mm-hmm. right? And then the very next year, they're still being sold by Nintendo at the same price. Yep. And and Sony, Sony screwed up so bad because that's one of the best systems ever made, right? Tons oh, yeah. of classic games. And what they released was just, it just doesn't even compare to what Nintendo had to offer. It's too bad because... It's a shame. I mean, a play, like a PlayStation Classic with... I mean, again, it's... It's so complicated when you're talking about licensing and you're, you're trying to, you know, and, and with the PlayStation itself, you know, so many of its most classic games were not first party yeah. games. So it, there's way more licensing they have to secure to get like yeah. the best PlayStation games on the PlayStation Classic. It was going to cost them a lot more. So it's just, it's harder. It's a lot harder to do. But, um, let me read uh, an article here real quick. Uh, got it up here. There we go. Uh, this comes from Silicon Era. PlayStation Classic price drops to 60 at two stores. Well, at two stores. Maybe the oh, online stores. I think everywhere. Well, well, I think it's uh, maybe online GameStop and Walmart. Oh, wow. Uh, Those people are big hoping, stores. <laughs> yeah. People hoping to bring the PlayStation Classic home for the holiday season have new options. The price on the plug-and-play console has dropped at two different outlets. If someone goes to the GameStop or Walmart official websites, they will find the system is available for $59.99. Wait, so who bought it one week ago that's kicking themselves right now? Oh, I know. Seriously. I'm sorry if that happened to you guys. I'd be so pissed. Yeah, I... This comes on the heels of an Amazon price drop. On December 22nd, 2018, the price of the PlayStation Classic dropped to 69.95. Wait, that the was normal price Christmas. of the system is 99.99. Holy cow. So, the PlayStation Classic made its debut on December 3rd, 2018. It comes with 20 PlayStation games, two controllers. Uh, some of the available titles include Final Fantasy VII, Metal Gear Solid, Revelations, Persona, and Wild Arms. You look at those four games, it's like that's those are great picks. But the rest of it, I mean, that's we just about a couple, it. though. Exactly, we've, we've talked about it on previous podcasts. It's the best. Have. It's a shame lineup. No, but hey, it's actually either, but... slowly becoming priced, like to where we might actually want to buy it if it yeah. keeps dropping. <laughs> if it if it dropped one more time into the forty or fifty yeah, dollars range, 50. I'd probably pick it up and try modding it. Sure. Yeah. Um, exactly. And then you know, putting the the Final Fantasy games on there and the other RPGs that I love from the PlayStation on there, but. Um, yeah, crazy, uh, especially, yeah. yeah, considering, like, this was the year I finally caved in and bought an NES Classic and an Me SNES too. Classic. Exactly. <laughs> and so it's like, yeah, the, S- the SNES Classic came out last year, I think, right? And then the NES yeah. Classic the year yep. before that. Yeah. And they're both selling at the same prices. But they launched at as they launched at exactly. But Reggie Fisame has said recently that this might be the last like batch they might not sell the classic systems yes. again next year they're probably not gonna do it and that, that what that means is yeah. they're they're i think they're looking to utilize the uh their online service the switch, on the exactly. switch more I which hope i so. don't <laughs> like well i i like and i don't like it like I because I know that they're that's going to be such a slow like drip feed of like games I actually True. care about every month, you know. Um, and so <clears> I just want have the sixty four and GameCube games to drop. Yes, I know that N sixty four in particular is kind of difficult to emulate, like yeah, accurately. Like yeah. you can get games working, but 
there are some games like Harvest Moon 64. It's very difficult to have that emulate perfectly. Like you'll have walls that don't appear or like weird like colored borders around buildings and just like weird sort mm. of glitches. The game works, it just doesn't it's not running perfect and so it wouldn't be like acceptable to release that as playable for an online official Nintendo product, you know. Mm. Um so I don't know. I I would have really liked to have had an N64 classic like dedicated little box maybe one cool. day probably not 2019 but maybe yeah. one day they'll they'll do that I that'd be nice they do but it seems like they want to get their switch now that they have because yeah. that released in september or something the online their paid online service right yeah so i think that they really want to push people that direction and so we'll see what happens but um rob says i'm assuming that sony has now learned there is no demand for the place P- P- play <laughs> the PS that is Classic. The one thing they learned. No, uh, it's not that there's no demand for a PlayStation Classic. Uh, there's no demand for that <laughs> PlayStation Classic. The yeah. one that they decided to make. That's what nobody wants. But people do want a PlayStation Classic. Yeah, I think I think Make Rob when he put when he puts learned in quotations is is uh being a bit facetious there, but um right. yeah, we'll yeah that's probably three. It's probably what they did learn, even though they shouldn't have learned that. <laughs> um, That's Mel what they'll Riza, tell their investors, right? Riza says, honestly, most of the games on PS1 Classic I'd never heard of before. Yeah, me too. Me too. There was me some too. of them on there. I was like, huh? Yeah, we were surprised and, at some of those. Very weird. Um, okay, so anyways, if you want to pick up a PlayStation Classic and try and mod it, go for it. It's cheaper now. Maybe it'll be even cheaper in another month. Maybe wait just a little bit yeah, longer. Yeah, I'd wait a little longer. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it'll go down to 50 or 40 bucks. But, but here's uh, the thing. Don't wait too long because um, I don't think they're going to make a second batch of these. <laughs> Once they're gone, they're gone. Sony's not yeah, getting into true. this game again. That's true. Yeah. Um, yep, so keep an eye on it. All right, let's move on to our main topic today. Today I want to talk about tutorials. Um, being a fan of RPGs, I've been through my fair share of annoying, long-winded, text-heavy, boring tutorials in my time. And um, I recently played through uh, Kingdom Hearts. I just finished Kingdom Hearts 1 yesterday on stream here on Twitch. It's a great game. um, Yeah, you know, I I, I like it overall. Um, There are certainly certain levels that are better than others. Yes. Uh, I'm looking at Hollow Bastion as a shining example and Atlantica as a just pit of despair. (laughs) Just (laughs) awful, awful, awful design. They didn't Um, have the water controls quite down yet. Oh, man. And then just like it's really long, too. It's way longer than the other worlds are. Mm -hmm. Uh, Deep Jungle and uh, had like a lot of backtracking Agrabah is kind of the same way. So there was kind of this, like, for me, it shown really brightly in, in the early section, the tutorial, which is what I really want to talk about. I yeah. love destiny Island. Yeah. Um, and even, um, Traverse town, like those sections that sort of like get you into the game and introduce the scenario. Those are really good. And then it's like, wonderland, Atlantica, Agrabah. It's like, Oh my gosh. And then like, it just like, or Adla- yeah, Atlantic. I think I said that. Then it just like shoots up again, and is just like super great in um, what is it? Uh, the Halloween Town. Halloween oh Town yes, and um, I love Hall that Bastion. Level. Yeah, super good. Like really well designed, genuinely well paced, just good stuff. Um, and then uh, the the boss fight between uh, Sora and then Riku Ansem. Super good fight. Yeah. Um, final boss fight's pretty intense. I like it too. So, anyways, uh, I'm getting off track here. We'll talk about the tutorial. <laughs> I was very <laughs> impressed by the tutorial. Now, we've talked about tutorials a little bit on our old podcast. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think the first thing that you jump to when you're talking about like well designed tutorials, we, we often want to reference Nintendo games and specifically Nintendo platformers. Um, and the way that the first world in a Mario game 
is almost always set up to be a tutorial that introduces you to all the powers. Yeah. Not not always, but a lot of times introduce you to all the powers. <laughs> the, yeah. the, the, the design, it's designed to sh kind of show you the limits of your jumping and like what you can jump on to destroy yeah. it and what you can't jump on. And it sort of introduces you to all the concepts and gives you all the skills you need. And then you move into world two and beyond. And like, you know, you, you're kind of like, let loose so to speak to sort of like approach it and um and uh go crazy and and you you have all the tools that you need and you know what you need to do now it's very easy to design an intuitive like textless sort of like tutorial like that for a game where you run a and jump simple old game yeah <laughs> and d-pad and two buttons <laughs> and you Easy. jump and you get a power up and then you press b to throw fire <laughs> yeah, and that's it. you know it's like very minimal inputs and it's, it's just a very simple game overall so yeah. trying to like help people understand that concept is really easy and you don't need to tell them anything they'll sort of figure it out but as we move from that into games where you do need to actually deliver some level of information you need to like describe a strategy or describe how to equip materia or something like that it becomes a lot more difficult to just sort of like without any text or without explaining anything just like give the player the tools and just like design a level so that they'll kind of like put the pieces together right so there has to be some level where a character explains something to you and there's some level of, of text. Um, yeah. Especially for older games that didn't have voice acting. With voice acting now, there's almost no excuse. Um, but what is the right balance? You know, I, I've been trying to think about that. And, I, and I'm trying to, I was trying to think about like what made the, the Destiny Island section of Kingdom Hearts like so engaging for me, right? Like I, almost to the, to the point where I forgot or didn't think about the fact that it was a tutorial that was teaching me the game. I was just engaged in like what was happening and it was really fun. Um, so, I watched uh, a video on tutorials from, um, uh, what is, what are they called? Uh, they have like the, the guy with the high pitched voice and they teach video games. And they have oh, like a um, extra thing. credits? Yes, extra credits. Thank yeah, you. extra credits. Um, I will put the link to that in the description of the video on YouTube because um, it was very good. Um, but there were a couple of points they made in that that I, I was going through that and I was like, yes, 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 absolutely, yes. <laughs> like This is exactly what I've been preaching on my channel too. Like, mm. So the first thing that... Uh, but before we get started, though, is there anything that you wanted to add to what what your thoughts are on tutorials in general do you think that well that, do you get do you get bored with rpg tutorials a lot or yeah. you, you kind of like whatever it's fine yeah and typically the the like what the like result that we usually come to with this discussion is that it's a necessary evil <laughs> in some ways um, yeah. But I remember as a kid, the tutorials, because I remember thinking Ocarina of Time had a really cool tutorial, right? Mm -hmm. Because in Ocarina of Time, you have um, people telling you what to do, and they tell you the button, and the button's highlighted, and it says, like, what you're doing and stuff. And when I first played it, I liked it because I hadn't played very many 3D games. Mm -hmm. And all, all of a sudden, it was like, oh, Z-targeting. Holy cow, that's so cool. Oh, you can move the camera around and look at everything, and it's crazy. And I, I didn't, like... I don't, we just hadn't really played 3D games before. Yeah. Coming back to it now, it is not a great tutorial. <laughs> I don't think it's like bad. It's just when somebody's standing up there telling you to target them with Z, it's weird, I guess. But when I was a kid, I actually didn't mind it that much. Yeah. Um, and when I first played it, I was actually like, oh, that's really cool. Every new thing I learned how to do through the tutorial and then I would do it, I thought it was really cool. Uh, so I just kind of want to throw that out there, but there are a few other games that I think did things well, like, um, Mario RPG did a really good job with, uh, with the very beginning stage when you're fighting Bowser, because instead of it just being a text base the whole time telling you what to do, it's like, um, you got Bowser and you got the chain chomp and you got peach 
and Peach is telling you what to do. Like, no, attack the chain, don't attack him, and then the chain lets go of... Anyways, it's it's a really well done um, tutorial, I'd say, because it's really simple. And they don't teach you everything at once. They just teach you the basics of how an RPG battle system works, mm -hmm. just in general. Yeah. And uh, then later on, Toad comes, and you have your little Toad time where you learn how to do timed hits and stuff like that. And right, I, I, right. I really like that. Yeah. So, so, but anyways, also Persona Five. Persona Five has a great tutorial. Okay, I someone think. else mentioned that actually in the chat yeah. here. What what is the Persona Five tutorial? I've not played Persona Five. I played Persona Four. <laughs> I did not like its early section at all. The first three hours, <laughs> essentially, hard... I don't like. So, yeah. Well, so Persona what is... Five kind of changes that a bit. And in Persona Five, you start out at the very beginning of the game. You start out. They do an N Media res kind of thing where you're. Yeah. You, you're not really um, necessarily at like the beginning, beginning of the game. You start out in an action sequence, right? And you're at like a casino. And um, anyways, it, it's it's really cool the way that they started out. But you go in and you, you get into your battle system. And instead of telling you a lot of things at once, it's just like one thing at a time that you do. And then that mm. you try. And then in the next battle, there's like another thing that's introduced just like briefly. But it's really out of the way, and and it's really intuitive. Just the battle system in general is just super intuitive. Uh, they don't need to tell you push this button for items because it's it's kind of like in Mario RPG, like you see that, like the items are there. You push that button for items. You don't need anyone to tell you that. Yeah. Um, but anyways, the tutorial in Persona Five is actually really good. Hmm. Maybe I will try it out. Yeah, you should. Yes. You should. And it's Persona right at the very beginning. It's so good. I don't know if I'll ever finish a Persona game. They're like <laughs> they're 3, very long. 000, three thousand hours long. <laughs> yeah, they're very long. It's kind of the same problem with Dragon Quest uh, Eleven. Very very long game. Yeah. But um, just for the sake of like the the tutorial, I'm interested. Maybe I'll watch a video on it. I'm not gonna buy a game. Just well, it's actually hard to find videos on Persona Five online. Oh, uh, because of Atlas. That's right. Yeah, I'm sure they exist, but it's not like they're everywhere. You know. <laughs> okay, so. I'm I kind of just put together like four things that for me are really important in designing a good tutorial or at least a tutorial that for me does not get tedious does not frustrate me. Um number 1 is text heavy tutorials are very frustrating. Um and this is where my love of Xenoblade Chronicles and my hate of Xenoblade Chronicles 2 <laughs> is going to come out in force. Uh, nice. So warning to anyone who's watching who loves Xenoblade 2, I do not like that game mm. at all. And I'm sorry that we disagree on that point. I hope <laughs> that you will listen to what I have to say and take uh. it uh, in stride and, and that you will not hate on me because I have a difference of opinion. But I despise Xenoblade Chronicles 2. It is not a, oh, that game's not for me. It, it, it is an active hatred that they have taken something that I thought was so good and that like brought JRPGs back into the limelight again, made JRPGs great again. <laughs> <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> and then they took that and they fetching ruined all the stuff I like about it in Xenoblade 2 uh, and they introduced mm. all this crap that I hate in it. Okay, so here we go. Less text. Do not do text heavy tutorials. Yeah, the di the big difference between the way they do tutorials in Xenoblade Two versus Xenoblade One, they they'll still interrupt you, right? So like you come into a fight and it's like bloop, and the the battle pauses. They bring up a window to like explain something to you. The big difference is in Xenoblade Two, it is straight text, paragraphs and paragraphs and windows and windows of clicking through and reading text, 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 text to explain all of it. In Xenoblade 1, they bring up a window with a photo, like a screenshot of the mm. thing they're talking about. And they have arrows pointing at it. And they say, you see this? It's very minimal text. It's like mm. a couple sentences. This is this. And you see a visual representation of it. Bloop, right there. You click through that, they show another screenshot. This is how this works. One or two sentences, maybe three. And they show it. And, and they pace that information really well. So it's like they'll teach you one particular thing. And then they let you use it on the enemy you're fighting. Bloop, 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 bloop. You fight, kill it. Awesome. Good job. You move on to the next thing. They'll bring up a different, you know, uh, principle or a different mechanic or something like that. They'll show you what it looks like. And 
I've talked a lot about uh, show, don't tell in like writing um, yeah. where you, you try your best to like show information, not just have characters explain it in dialogue. I think that this principle actually applies to good tutorials too. If you can show the player how something works rather than just telling them th with words or with just plain text, it will stick a lot better. Um, think about like, uh, when you're back in school, right? And, and you know, it, it, there's different kinds of learners. There are, you know, uh, people who learn better when they when they hear something, you know, audible. Um, people who l learn better or it sticks better when they read something. Some people, they have to, like, get hands-on and they have to actually, like, do something and then it sticks in their brain. Um, and so if you, if you remember back in school, any project where you were, like, in science class or something like that, you actually, like, got hands-on and... and like did an experiment like to me that always stuck a lot better in my head than just like reading about it in the textbook and so for me if you can design a tutorial where you play a video even or just show a photograph and be like this is where this is at and this is where this is at and point at those things and show the player visually I think that those tend to be a lot more engaging rather than just having a huge window of a huge paragraph of text explaining everything. And you go like, wait a minute, where's that? Where's that? I, uh, you know, so to me, removing as much text as possible and showing the player through demonstrations, I think is, is a much better and more engaging way of doing it. So that's my principle number one. Um, principle number two, don't teach everything about your game <laughs> at the very beginning don't yeah. slam it all into the first very hour. important <laughs> <laughs> um actually some... we got a comment here talking about that that's a v shawak saying a good chunk of what's explained in xenoblade chronicles 2 doesn't become relevant until way later yes that's yes. ridiculous so that that that's actually sort of like a sub principle of this as well right so imagine that you went to school uh, whether you're at college or high school or whatever, and on the first day of school, let's even say the first week of school, they taught you everything from the whole semester in one day or in one week, and then they're like, okay, now we're going to do tests. And then you the slowly the take the test throughout the year, yeah. <laughs> throughout the rest of the year. Yeah. that you, you could not absorb all that information in one day. Like, that's, that's not how, that's not, our brains can't handle that. So the same principle applies to a complex RPG with a lot of systems in it. If you try to just completely front load that and just like throw all that information, especially in text heavy paragraphs in your first hour and be like, okay, we gave you everything you need. If you forget something, go into the journal and like, <laughs> like look it up again, but here you go, play the game now. It's just like, oh my gosh, that first hour is just such a drudge. It's, I mean, there, there is something very important about hooking someone right off the bat and, and giving them a promise of what's to come so that they go, okay, like, that's cool. I want to know no more now. I, I would like to continue playing or reading or watching this because I'm intrigued by the premise. And if you bog down your premise, your hook at the beginning of the game with just like a bazillion tutorials, oh man, you can really, really kill uh, interest in the game. This is essentially what happened to me when playing Persona 4. Like, and it's not just a tutorial. It's not just a, like a tutorial for the first three hours. It's just so much text. It's so much yeah. talking and so, and I get it. Like I get that that's kind of the point. I get that it's, you're supposed to like get invested in relationships with these people. And I still believe that you could cut the, that dialogue by at least 25%. I could say mm -hmm. almost pushing 50%, get the same exact sentiments, understand the character's plights, care about them, get their quirky, you know, individual sort of um, personalities, and still have good pacing <laughs> through the beginning of that game. So uh, a lot of people will just skip tutorials uh, when it yeah. starts getting really long like that, and that's really bad. I think because, that's a bad sign. Exactly. Yeah. Because some of those people, like I, I tend to do this sometimes too, when I'm getting like really frustrated with too yeah. much dialogue, I'll start skipping through it. And it's like, I got the idea. 
But then they'll mm-hmm. say something really important at the end of their ten paragraph dialogue. Well, that's like now I know, that's they're telling you where to go, and now I don't and know now, where to go. <laughs> no, this is actually important. Somebody mentioned this um, a little. Hold on, let me find it in the comments um, with Final Fantasy X. So Peter Pam eighteen oh seven says yes, the Final Fantasy X sphere grid. On my first play, I lost interest somewhere in the tutorial yep. and forgot about it after the tutorial. Yep. I got in the fight on the beach just after the cinematic with Sin and the Crusaders, and I hit a wall. Ha <laughs> uh-huh. It's like there was something in Final Fantasy X that they talked about in the early tutorial stage that didn't come into play later on, but the people forgot or skipped through because it didn't seem relevant. And then you, you end up getting screwed. RPGs specifically, you end up getting screwed with stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. Because it's like the, you can't those tutorials don't can come again. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, some of the players who need those tutorials the most are the ones skipping through them because they don't exactly. like tons of dialogue and talking and <laughs> yeah. text. And it's like, yeah. then they have no idea what to do. So less text and don't front load the game. Don't, don't freaking just like put all the information right at the beginning. You got to pace mm. that out. And this goes to the point that uh, was it V. Sherlock had made, or who was the person who had you, you said brought up the, the point? Where it doesn't about, become uh, relevant to later. Yeah, yeah. V. Sherlock. So, yes, only give information when it's relevant. Right? You're about to use this, you'll need to know this. If I don't need to know it right now, if I'm not going to use it right now, if it's not going to be uh, something that's necessary to teach right now, don't teach it right now. Wait until yeah, it's yeah. necessary. Now, this is something Xenoblade 2 does try to do, and I'll give it credit for that, is that it does not front load its information. The tutorial is like 20 hours long. <laughs> they are like constantly sort of drip feeding you information as you go through it. However... Hmm. I'm going and I'm going to bring up uh I'm going to bring up an example for this, right? There's also like the right time and place, I feel, to do that as you're drip feeding information. And here the, in this scene in Xenoblade 2, right? You're about to do like a big boss fight against Malos, and they have a very large build up to this. Very large. There's bombastic music and like pyra and um i forget the name of the kid uh fetch main character forget his name someone's gonna correct me i don't anyways i never played they're they're sort of like for the first time kind of fighting together and like his blade ignites and and it's a very like there's i don't know it's just a very big scene and there's a lot of action and it's building up to the fight and then watch what happens as soon as you start fighting this electric guitar and it's getting intense there was a lot of dialogue there like all right like get ready to fight his name's rex by the way rex is his name thank you and then it's like okay party formation what are you talking about we only have one character right now and then okay fight time to take nope tutorial let's go tutorial tons of text right before a boss fight why why would you pick this moment to do a tutorial listen to the music it's awesome this yeah is, it's so this awesome is, this is freaking mitsuda at his best it's so yeah. intense Blind and throughout this spot. entire yeah. fight throughout this entire fight they continually ah. interrupt you yeah. with tutorial ah. messages it's, it's oh, i can't believe that they did that yeah. teach that stuff before you get to the boss fight and let the player go nuts on the boss fight with all the stuff they learned. And, oh, Xenoblade 2 is so bad with this. They will, like, put you into a new area. It's like, okay, the area is going to open up and you're going to explore. Here we go. Blank. Stop for a second. Let me dump some tutorial on you for a minute here. They constantly interrupt the flow of the game and the pace of the game with these just horribly timed tutorials and xenoblade one was so much better with that this is the same team this is the same director i don't know how they don't know what they're doing is so (laughs) wrong (laughs) anyways oh man i haven't played this game so i can't speak to it but that is incredibly annoying it's so annoying and and it just goes on forever it's just like 20 hours of that essentially um 
So this leads into my next point, which is that it's really important to make your tutorial interesting. Like, rather than it just being, okay, sit down for a second, bro. Uh, maybe we had our um, in, in Medius Res scene at the beginning to hook you, right? This is kind right. of what Final Fantasy VII does um, and Final Fantasy VIII as well. Like, we had our in Medius Res um, scene at the beginning to hook you and get you excited. Now we're going to sit back for a second. I'm going to explain how equipping materia works, okay? So just sit back and read all this. This is important information. Um, a lot of times, games will do that. So, like, they understand they can't just, like, throw tons of text at you at the beginning or they'll lose you. They, so they, they get their... They, they have a good hook, but then it's like, all right, there's a lot of complicated stuff in this game. Sit back and here we go. Um, this is why I really liked the Destiny Islands section of Kingdom Hearts. No. Um, because... That entire, I, I kind of forgot that I was going through a tutorial during that island section because I got so like wrapped up in the rivalry between Riku and Sora. And this is actually something that Pokemon does too, right? Like with the whole rival character. I think that's such a genius thing, especially for kids of that age, like middle school, high school, maybe elementary, who like you know, you have that buddy of yours or someone who's really good at something and you're like, man, I wish I was good at that too. And, yeah. and you kind of like compete at stuff, even though you're friends. Uh, I don't know if you're supposed to be friends with the rival in Pokemon. He's kind of just an no. evil. But yeah, they don't <laughs> like each other. But Riku and Sora, I really like that dynamic because yeah. you both hate and love Riku at the same time. Like yeah. you're friends and he's a good kid at heart and he's cool. And you want to be like him because he's taller than Sora. He's like... Yeah. He's, like, better built than Sora. He's stronger. Yeah. He's stronger, and he's cooler looking. He's <laughs> and cooler. He's, he's just a beast. And it's like, man, I want to beat that guy. You All of a sudden, like, you just get wrapped up in that. And even at 31 years old, I was just playing this game last <laughs> week. I wanted to, to beat that guy. Like, yeah. I did not want to leave Destiny Islands until I was up. Because they keep track of the score. That was also brilliant. That was a brilliant move. Because they, you, you fight and they keep track of how many times Riku has won and how many times Sora has won, and then you go into the race and they do the same thing. They keep adding on to it, yeah. and so even when you get a fail, ratio. yeah. So it's like even when you fail, you go, "Oh, I need to do it again because I need to beat Riku," which right. means you're, you're practicing thing, it. Yeah, you don't have to do it again though. Yeah, you can yeah. just move on after the first race or after the first fight. Mm -hmm. But it's like you you want to you want to continue the tutorial until you master those skills yes it's pretty cool yes yeah you're right it, it no one's forcing you yeah. to practice it over and over till you get it right and some players are like okay i get the idea i can move on if they want to but i was like no i'm not leaving here until i am beating riku yeah. and so that taught me the controls like i got a feel for the controls in the platforming I got a feel for the controls in combat. And I was better at the game after leaving Destiny Island because I was wrapped up in the rivalry, right? They designed a tutorial section that engaged me on a narrative level and on a character level. And I didn't even realize that the purpose of it was to get me to practice it and get better at it. Yeah. And it's just, I was so impressed by that. Also, as you play Riku, and usually, because the first time most people fight Riku, you you lose, right? You don't win. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you you learn that there's, as as you're losing, right? You learn that there's a pattern to what Riku does. When he does this attack, you have this much time to go in. When mm -hmm. he does this attack, and there's certain tells. And that's important because every enemy throughout Kingdom Hearts kind of does that. Yeah. And, and you get to learn in a relatively safe environment. <laughs> yeah. Like... Well, before they do this move, um, or you can't block this, you have to roll out of the way for this one. Or I guess you can't roll till later, but yeah, well, just kind of like, um, yeah, step out of the way because you'll hit him a couple of times, and yeah. he'll drop down into like, like on his hands, but then he like pushes with his feet forward, right? And so you have a yeah. second to sort of like deke out, out of the way, just like move to the side and avoid that attack. Um, yeah, it's just, it's really great, and um, it's it like. I loved just like the whole scenario because it's very like um, mysterious, right? It's like at first I kind of ex like thought this was sort of like a Lord of the Flies situation. Like it's just a bunch of kids 
who have no yes. idea how they got on this island, but they <laughs> yeah. never questioned it before. And then you find out yeah. Sora's got a, a home on the main island and his He's mom's there parents, and stuff. Technically, but yeah. it was just, it was like, dude, what's going on here? Like, Kyrie came in, and the, the, now they're questioning like life itself and existence, and whether there are other worlds out there. And it's just like this whole yeah. situation is just like, well, what's going on? And and you kind of get really invested in this sort of like uh, triangular relationship between Riku, Kyrie, and Sora. Uh -huh. And the the rivalry itself just really drives you to master the mechanics early on. It's a very fun and interesting and engaging tutorial. And and like like I love how they keep pushing you too, because you you fight like uh, <clears throat> Titus and and Waka and Selfie, right? And then you go and you fight Riku, and you're like, okay, I got this. Like I figured Riku mm -hmm. out. I got him. And then you go do the race a few times. Okay, I got it. And like I'm I'm one upping him. And then you come back and and Titus is like, "Oh yeah, uh Riku took all three of us on at one time. We couldn't even touch him." And this is like <laughs> another challenge. Just like, "Okay, yeah. now I have to do that because I have to prove that I'm better at him and I can do that too." So like yeah. three steps of like increasing the difficulty and like helping you master the feel of the game. And every yeah. time I was like, yes, I've got to do that because I have to prove I'm better than him. <laughs> and <laughs> the story yeah. and the mechanics, uh, the gameplay are weaved so well together there. Um, it's just, I think, in my opinion, a perfect tutorial section. Uh, Breno is saying Mike submit, which is a move that uh, Ansem uses in one of his final forms that I was raging hard on yesterday. I hated oh, that move. Funny. Um... Riker's beard says, even with those principles in mind, where would the line be drawn between engaging well-made tutorial and hand-holding the player to the point of condescension towards the player? For example, the Soul series gets incorrectly criticized for throwing the player into the deep end with no direction. But if you're actually paying attention, the entire first part of the game is fairly linear and designed in such a way to carefully drip feed you each mechanic of the game. This is very true. So I think what he's referencing in... Uh, Dark Souls, for instance, um, a lot of people get upset because they get dropped down to the first like bonfire area, and maybe they'll wander into uh, like the cave, like the the caves that lead down, which is a late later game area, and like the skeletons over there just completely annihilate you. <laughs> and yeah. a lot of players are like, "What do I do? These guys are way too hard." And you're that's not like really supposed to. Zelda. You're not supposed to go that way first. And that's the tell, that you're not supposed to go that way. But a lot of players don't realize, oh, we go up the hill this way, and that leads to the first area. They don't they don't see it, or maybe it's a little out of the way. Right. Maybe they could have done a better job of sort of highlighting, like, go this way kind of a thing. But, in my opinion, the, the entire purpose of the skeletons being that hard is to dissuade you from going the way. Like, do not come this way yet. You're not ready. Um, right. but, but before you even get there, you are actually... The, the opening scenario, uh, I forget the name of the the area, the first area you go to, because you can return there later. Um, but it's kind of just like this cathedral-esque sort of place, and you're kind of going through there. And they, and they do that. They have the messages on the floor that sort of like teach you the basic mechanics, and then each enemy you encounter there sort of is meant to help you practice until you've got more or less all the mechanics taught to you in that first section. Then you have that big boss fight. Um and then you can kind of move on to the game, and then it opens up to you from there. And Demon Souls was uh, was done that way. Actually, all of them are done that way. They have sort of like an opening section that's a bit more linear, and then they kind of open the game to you after you've done that. Undead Asylum, thank you, Riker's Beard. That's the, the first area of Dark Souls. Um, <clears throat> anyways, I think that uh, those are done pretty well for the most part, the tutorial sections of Dark and Demon Souls and Bloodborne and all that stuff. Um... Okay, and so the last part of one I wanted to talk about, uh, part number four of how to design a tutorial, um, is to design missions or levels. Um, because we talked about how don't front load, right? Like don't put all your information at the beginning. So you're going to have yeah. to give them and, and, and make sure that what, when you deliver the information, it's relevant, right? So in order to create... Um, sections of the game or levels that are relevant to a certain thing the player needs to know. Design a mission where you're going to use this mechanic or this principle or this strategy or whatever it is. And then and, and the entire section is based on teaching that particular principle. You go in there, you master that mechanic, and then you move on to the next section. 
and you will continue to use that thing you learned, but now we'll add a new thing. So we'll teach you one new thing. And we have a whole mission designed around using that in tandem with the thing you learned before. Hmm. It's like, okay, now I have a handle on these two things. And then you go to your next mission and the next mission introduces a new thing. And it's like, okay, it's kind of centered. You have enemy design, the design of the, the level itself. You're introducing the new aspects, but keeping them using the things they've learned before until you've gone through everything there is. And now you can just let them go at it and be creative and use the principles in the way that they want. Um, one example of this that I don't think is the best example, but it is kind of an example I'm talking about, is in Final Fantasy VIII when you go into the fire cave at the beginning, right? So oh, yeah, you have yeah. to learn you have to learn about junctioning magic because yeah. you have to you don't have to, but it makes it a lot easier to fight Ifrit when you're using ice spells. And so like yeah. the, the but the thing is is that they teach you about a lot more than just junctioning magic spells there. They teach you about junctioning GFs, they teach you about um, Yeah, they have you go into the menu and it takes forever as they yeah, explain every It's a everything. very long yeah. they they basically teach you the entire UI of the menu. Yeah. Instead of just teaching you how to junction ice spells or something, <clears throat> G GFs and ice spells. It's like you need a GF, and then you need like to learn how to put magic on yourself. And if they had left it at that, and then sent you in there, and you use that, and then you come out and it's like, okay, now mission two, you're probably going to want to equip some items, and so you yeah. need to make sure that you put the item command into your command menu <laughs> and so that you'll have that available, you know? So they teach it mm. just a drip feed and each mission is structured to where you'll have to use that thing. Um, <clears throat> to me, if you can do all four of those things, don't use too much text, show more than you tell. Don't put all of your, all of, don't teach them everything about the game in the first hour or the first section of the game. Um, make the tutorial fun or interesting by introducing, if, if it's a story-driven game, kind of like Kingdom Hearts is, that rivalry section on Destiny Islands. Oh, and, uh, some other good examples I wanted to bring up. The Modern Warfare um, like training section at the beginning, where you kind of go through and shoot the targets, and they sort of like uh, take you through like a whole training course. Like That's a really good example, too. Um, and you can go through that course over and over to beat your own time, so they encourage you to like try it again and again and get better at it. Um, Splinter Cell is another example where they have that sort of thing. They have like a training course at the beginning, and you're you know uh, Lambert's is it Lambert? I think it's Lambert. Is sort of like talking to you and like training you on the different like ways to move and like how shadow and light works and how you know making noise works and how to grab people and knock them out and hide the bodies like everything and they mm -hmm. teach you about all your equipment and then they throw you into the first level but it makes sense because it's like that's what you would do because because um uh what's his name i'm so bad with names has anyone noticed this yet i've played this game like 20 times i don't remember the name of the main character <laughs> splinter cell what um it's fact? sam 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 fetch what's his name Sam. Is it Sam, right? <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe this. What is his freaking name? Sam. I, I'm like I'm like on the Fisher, Fisher thank Sam you. Fisher. <laughs> Fetch. Anyways, Fisher is coming back from not being active for a while. So they're like yeah. teaching him about his new tools and equipment and weapons and all that stuff right yeah so like there's like a story purpose for it and like there's clever dialogue there and like there's one point where they're like okay get started and you, the whole section is about being very quiet not making any noise and like, sticking to the shadows and not alerting anybody and you kind of come to the end of it and and uh Lambert will come back on and be like fisher you can start uh whenever you're ready oh you're at the end holy crap like <laughs> <laughs> amazing work or whatever you know yeah. so like they have that kind of like witty dialogue between lambert and fisher they're like building their relationship as mm -hmm. um uh colleagues or whatever they have colleagues, a past yeah. together and and doing all of that with the story at the same time that you're learning the mechanics um portal is really good at this i think that valve oh, yeah. games valve games uh, as a whole half-life uh, portal um, they're very good at this, where you're you're playing through a tutorial, but really it's just a lot of fun. You don't even realize that that's what's happening. And yeah. the characters are explaining to you what to do. Kind of that same format where it's like a training 
essentially. Um, Halo was really good in its tutorial section. Um, anyways, there's a lot of good examples where you can make the tutorial just as fun and interesting and engaging where you're actually playing it and learning it as you're playing it without just like dumping paragraphs of text on people and explaining everything um, just with, with text. So, Yeah, I'd Anyways. agree with that. I think if we're going to talk about tutorials, though, we do have to bring up Breath of the Wild. Yeah, so someone else brought that up bit. too. Yeah. Yeah, somebody brought it up in the chat a while ago. But because um, there are certain, for the most part, I think that was actually a super well done tutorial. The the main island or island, the plateau. whatever you call it, the the main spot, the first the, pla spot the plateau, yeah. right? The Great Plateau. Yeah. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the old man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he just kind of messes with. He's like, "Oh, I'll give you this thing if you." beat that shrine no psych i'm not going to give it to you anymore i changed my mind um that just kind of i hate it when that kind of stuff happens that just bugs me because <laughs> it's like i'm literally the only chance of being the hero of hyrule and you're not going to give me this thing you said you were going to give it to me um but the way the shrines are designed and the way that the whole plateau kind of like functions is really really well done i think and it's very minimal text like there really mm -hmm. is very little um yeah like explanation of what to do it's just kind of you mess around and you figure it out and every now and then there's like a something that pops up like oh you can drop your your you can magnet stuff and drop it on top of enemies like that's pretty cool um but for the most part i think um breath of the wild does a really good job with the tutorial and that you never really get those tutorial moments again for the whole rest of the game Mm. And and it does a very little to begin with um, in the first place. So I don't know. I think I think that was really well done. But it's specifically geared towards the story and towards the game itself. Mm. And not every game can get away with that, you know. Uh, Gliding Falcon says, "I liked Wind Waker's tutorial. Made you feel at home at outside yeah. island." Yeah, that, that that's actually almost a direct parallel to like how destiny islands was for me right like you get attached to the place and you get attached yeah. to the people and then yeah. when his sister gets carried off by the bird it's like oh fetch like now you're really invested and and it really matters to you right yeah because they had a good scene between him and his sister early on with the the, the telescope thing telescope yeah um Riker's Beard says, best tutorial is a link to Google.com. <laughs> <laughs> Type it in yourself. You know what's funny, though? I have been doing that lately because I have the Super Nintendo Classic. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I have added a few extra games to it um, than were there originally. And those games don't come with manuals the way the other ones do. <laughs> well, they, they did if you bought it in the package. And originally. The, yeah, like the manual in the box or whatever. However they're really hard to find now. And so um, I've been Googling for PDFs of those manuals. Oh, the manuals, <laughs> the original manuals, right. Because the games, there is no tutorial in the early games. There's minimal tutorials, right? Sometimes it's a Mario level or something. But I started playing some of the football games lately, like mm -hmm. Emmett Smith football or Madden 95, <laughs> you know? They're straight up Super Nintendo or even uh, some of the basketball games they do not tell you how to play the game. And it is really hard. So at first, I drop back for a pass, right? I'm playing College Football 1997, Road <laughs> to New Orleans. I'm playing that game because BYU is actually ranked very high in that game. Anyway, um, and I'm the quarterback. Play number one, right? I drop back. My dudes run out. They have letters on top of their heads, right? So I know who's who. I push A because A is open. And my quarterback dives on the ground. <laughs> and... I'm out. Like, dude, that's a down, right? So great. Okay, second down. All right. But what something weird must have happened. Okay, now I have to throw to B. So I push B and I can't remember what my character does. He does like a spin move or something. He doesn't I realize immediately after I get sacked the second time, I'm like, he's in running mode. I'm but I didn't select a running play. I must have to push some kind of button first to get him into passing mode and then push the patch button, right? <laughs> but I couldn't figure out what that button was. I held L, I held R, I pushed select, I pushed all the buttons I could think of. And then finally I pushed Y, no, or no, the top one, X. And I pushed X, nothing happened, and I got sacked, right? And I finally decided 
this game's ridiculous. I looked it up online. The manual doesn't exist. Nobody talks about the controls. It was so <laughs> frustrating. And I, so I start playing with Tanner because he wants to play that, right? So my little brother Tanner, very into football and football yeah. games. Um, he figures it out. You do press X. You press X, and then you press A or B or Y. So you have to go into passing program. mode. But that enables passing throw. mode. But there was no indicator that I was in passing mode once I pushed that button mm. when I first pushed it, right? So I push, yeah. you have to push X and then push YBA. And my gosh, that was so absolutely frustrating. But once I finally figured that out, the game finally opened up to me and I could do things. Yeah. But there was no way for me to know what to do. It was unbelievably frustrating. And I was just done playing the game because there basically was no tutorial. However, as um, I figured things out for myself, the game did become pretty rewarding because yeah. I had kind of figured some of that stuff out. <laughs> um, and as I slowly figured out other things, like, oh, here's how you, um, like, strife, what's the word, sidestep, you know, oh, as you're a step. defender. Here's how you go into that. Here's how you run and sprint, you know. And it was kind of cool because a lot of it's really intuitive. And even though it sucked at first and I was dying and it just wasn't working, um, I did learn everything I needed to learn e eventually, right? <laughs> and then I was able to do it because it wasn't all that complicated. Um, and there really, there was no tutorial. And I think some games that might actually be advantageous to to just kind of have people figure that stuff out for themselves. I know it's really frustrating, um, but <laughs> there are a lot of games like um, games where you fight the final boss, but you're supposed to lose. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I think Chrono Trigger does this. Um, there's a lot of games that do this. You're supposed to lose that first boss fight. But you, you feel okay because the game, you knew you had to lose. There was nothing you could do. You were going to lose. It didn't matter. Um, but almost the real life equivalent of that was me plugging a game into the Super Nintendo, not knowing how to play it, and losing my first game because I didn't really know what I was doing. And then the next game I was able to win because I had figured it out. Um, mm -hmm. It's almost parallels that exact type of thing, right? You're supposed to lose your first game because you just started playing. You don't know what you're doing. And I don't know, somehow it, it still was a tutorial. Even not having a tutorial still somehow <laughs> was a tutorial for me. It's just you're meant to lose that first fight. Yeah. I don't uh, know. Beaverman says in German, the, ver the German version of um, Wind Waker, it's not Outset Island. It's called Preludian. So it's actually got sort of like that, that, that um, sentiment of prelude into it or tutorial. Oh, uh, really? The German version of... Um... Outset Island is called. Outset is pretty. Oh, cool. Vishalak says replacement docks is a good site to try if you want to try and find some of those. Um... Okay, I had a hard time finding it. So. Um, no, no, I actually ran into a similar problem when playing uh, old NES games, even for like the reviews that I do, like Final Fantasy reviews, right? Because yeah. so often the game, especially NES games, had like huge limits on the text, the the amount of text you could have in the game, right? Because the games had to be very small. So um, they relied on the manuals. The manuals were thick and they had tons of info yeah. in them. They had info on yeah. enemies. They had like what the enemies uh, hit points and like what their you weaknesses know, were. That, that's and, kind like, of the whole equivalent. B that's the equivalent of what you're talking about with Xenoblade, how it's just paragraphs and paragraphs of just solid text. It's yeah. like a manual. It literally is like a manual. Yeah. They're just essentially in the game now. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, like one thing that, and this is a reason why I'm going to be redoing my Final Fantasy reviews one more time to like <laughs> the last hurrah. That's finally it. This is the legit version. Um, is because I would say things like, um, you look at, you could pull up the map in Final Fantasy one, and it just have dots all over the map, but there's no place names. You don't know what any of the towns are named or what they're called. And so it's like you need to go to this town. They'll give you a name. You have no direction on how to go there. Like, yeah. is it north? Is it south? Like, where is yeah. it? And so you pull up the map, and it's like, but just a ton of dots that litter like the world map. And it's like I don't know what any of these places are. Yeah, what's what? But if you looked at the manual, you would have seen a map that had all the place names on it, and you would have known. Okay, this is this city, and I need to go there next. So. You're right. If you're playing a game in the modern age and you didn't buy it in the box and pull out the manual and have that on you, a lot of times they did rely on the manual to sort of like teach you 
yeah. like how the game works. I remember Chrono Cross being that way to a certain extent when I was trying to get used to how that game works. They do have a decent tutorial in Chrono Cross, but it's missable because if you don't go talk to like the town elder, like he won't like teach you like the battle mechanics basically. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can kind of be like trying to figure it out like what on earth is this and how do I equip magic and what is this and um, there's in the manual they had a lot of that information for you that you could look up and that's kind of how older games from like like the beginning all the way through basically the PlayStation uh, and the N64 they had those thick like manuals and even into the PlayStation 2 you'd open the case and you know they have a, a, a bigger manual but then from there they kind of shrank more and more and more as like in game tutorials became more or less the standard yeah, and like now you start getting just like a one sleeve page <laughs> inside of your inside of your game, and it's like there's no manual at all anymore, and it's just like oh man, I missed that. But um, Riker's beard, thank you for subscribing. Yes, for thank you, Riker's time. beard. Appreciate it. One of these days, I'm going to figure out how to do uh, you know what they have on most Twitch channels, where someone subscribes and like a gift will play, and they have like music that goes like yeah, and like <laughs> yeah. it'll like put your name on the screen and like celebrate you. I'll figure that out one of these days. We'll do that. Um, anyways, uh, let's see. What are some people saying here? Um, hopefully, um, so Final Fantasy Victor Tactics. XB says, yeah, Final Fantasy Tactics have massive tutorials that I did multiple times back in the day, thanks to my OCD, but at least they were <laughs> optional. That's yeah. another thing that maybe we kind of glossed over here is that replaying a game, playing a game a second time, mm. where that tutorial is no longer useful it is important to be able to, to skip get it. through it pretty quickly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Skippable tutorials are very nice. Yeah. Uh, which ones will you redo? All of them or just some of them? I'm going to be doing the whole series over again from 1 to 15. <laughs> wow. Then but, you but, the 15 one, right? Yeah, but what I'm going to do is release them all at the same time, so to speak. So I haven't decided on this yet, but what's going to happen is I'm going to write them. I'm going to re- record all my footage. I'm going to like get it all set up. Then I will record like in, in one or two days, I'll sit down and just like do all my voiceover and record all the audio and edit it. And then I will edit all the videos and put them all together. And the whole series will be finished. All of them, one through 15 done at the same time. And yeah. then I'm going to release them from there but it's going to be like a follow me you know, follow the channel and next week i don't know if i'm going to do it every day for 15 days straight that would probably be better or Maybe. i could just do it once a week for 15 that's too long that's too long it's 15 weeks that's way too long um that's half a third of the year <laughs> yeah that's way too long I'll, I'll probably do it for 15 days just like Twice half a month okay, sure. every single day i'll upload a new one and i'll just do the whole series in it and there's there's two reasons why i'm doing this one is a lot of my information is incorrect or out of date uh on those final fantasy reviews two yeah. is i was doing them over such a humongous period of time that my style is completely different from one to the latest one which i think is 13. like the style the video is done in is just like absolutely incongruent it's like they don't feel like a series. It feels like really abrasive. If you go from 13 and you go back to one, it's like, what the freak? This isn't even the same. This is even the same. They can't be part of the same series. These things, two things are totally different types of videos. Yeah. So I'm going to make them all in the same style. I'm going to update my information. There's a lot of new information that's come out, like new interviews and things like that that clarify certain points. Yeah. So, like, I've, I've more or less written the first Final Fantasy retrospective redo, and it's like there's way more information now. It's a, it's a lot more interesting. Um, so, anyways, I'm kind of working on that in the background. It, it's not, like, the highest priority right now. Um because I'm doing Suikoden right now and Suikoden oh, 2. Yeah. And so those are my priority. I work on those mostly. But I, it, when I have time, I sort of slip in and, and like sort of update my old scripts on the Final Fantasy review series. And my plan is that next year I'm going to just do 15 straight. Well, I don't know how, how I'll be able to do 14 because that's going to take a lot of play time. But that's yeah. the goal. We'll see what happens. Right? <laughs> but anyways... Yeah. Uh, well, you have to redo Xenogears now that you know what happened with Disc 2. That, that's true. That pissed me off so much. It's because that, that interview with Takahashi explaining 
like why disc two is the way it is came out like a couple months after I posted my Xeno Gears review. Yeah, dude. So so I put up my uh, Dark <laughs> History, the PlayStation, the Nintendo PlayStation. Yeah. And about a month after I put it up, an interview came out where interviewing one of the guys talking about the Nintendo PlayStation and how he was saying that basically the whole thing was used to the advantage of the sound guy, the guy who made the sound chip, and he just kind of blew it up to be something it wasn't. Neither side actually cared that much when it happened. Mm. So Anyways, I actually made a video about it, but I didn't I didn't put it up. Um, but yeah, well, one month after my video came out, and I was like, dang it, that's new <laughs> info. I should have put that in. Yeah, oh. I, actually, I actually wonder how easy it would be for me to redo the Xenogears video because I still yeah. have the voice over, and else. it's... It's still done at a fairly high quality. Like, and that's, the, I guess that's the other reason. Like, the quality, the visual and audio quality on the older Final Fantasy, even though they are redos of the first versions that are not up anymore, still the audio quality is really bad on the FF4 review, the FF5 mm. review, and I would say FF6. Like, the, the, the quality of the voice over the audio clarity is not good. And so that really yeah. bothers me. But Xenogears is still pretty good. So I could probably just slip in a new paragraph to put that in there, take off the dark pixel overlays, oh, yeah. and update them to Resident Arc. But I don't know if I'll do that for Xenogears, because I'm really happy with how that video turned out in general. It's actually among my favorite videos that I've ever released on the channel. So I probably Gliding won't Gliding Falcon it. just subscribed. Oh, Gliding Falcon, thank you so much. Thanks, man. You're beast. Um, okay, let's move on to um, our community stories here. So uh, first, let me bring this up. Uh, um, let me read the, well first let me get, uh, so you guys can see this. So if we go into the community stories, this one comes from CJ. Uh, CJ says, hey all, I'm a longtime subscriber to the channel. I really appreciate the care you guys have always put into your content. Also, I love the new direction of the channel with the focus on storytelling. I've sung in a metal band called A Sense of Gravity for years, where I've dabbled with loose story concepts before. But I decided to do a spin-off project with some of my bandmates, where I tried to embrace some power metal cheese and write a full fantasy narrative end-to-end -end for an EP. Now, this is particularly interesting, because uh, Kaysen and I are into bands like Nightwish, um, yeah. who do this. They, like, write, essentially, like, um, what do you call it, uh concept albums where like the whole thing like tells a story yeah um, yeah similar to an opera but not quite <laughs> coheed coheed yeah. and cambria does this coheed did that yeah that was really cool. um one Ice of the bands I've, yeah one of the bands i've i've been into over the last decade or so periphery did this yeah. with their um i think it was jug no not juggernaut that's the newest one the one before Juggernaut, I can't remember the name of the album. Uh, Alpha and Omega, that's what it was. It was a concept oh. album, so it, t it told like a whole story. Um, so I love concept albums. If that's what you're doing here, CJ, that's freaking sweet. Um, so he has a, a link here to um, essentially an article that was written on it. Um, I'll put this in the description of the video, but uh, I'm just going to play play the song here for a second too and let you guys listen to it. It's pretty, it's pretty good. I, I, I liked it. I like it. I'm listening to it right now. It's really good, actually. <laughs> the guitar is super good. Yeah. Sick. <laughs> yeah, I love the, the keyboard, too. Yeah, it's actually good. It's good, uh... <laughs> Vocals are perfect for power metal. They're very good. <laughs> this, this, the whole sound of this whole band reminds me a lot of a symphony band. Like almost uh, exactly symphony band, Which is a company. I love Okay, so there's a, a preview of that. Again, links will be in the description of the video on YouTube. Um, I love it, man. I love it. Super, super, super good. That's that's my that's my jam right there. I love yeah. that kind of music. Um, 
your your vocals your vocals really nail that like eighties hair metal sort of like you know where they'll do the high pitch almost like a harmonic a harmonic on like their vocal cords like a yes. pinch harmonic <laughs> yeah Judas Priest yeah the the pinch har- the octave falsetto but like kind of but like on their voice it's crazy yeah um, I love Tim that. Owens was super good at that so cool um, anyways awesome uh, welcome Miss Monet Chrissy how you doing uh, Rira Rockus as well and everyone else that we've missed up to this point welcome to the chat. Um, anyways, super good stuff. Uh, love it. Um, yep. Okay, so now we have a couple questions from the audience, and then we'll wrap this up. Um, first one comes from CJ. I think it's the same CJ who uh, who was singing in the in the metal band there. Oh, cool. Um, have you ever noticed yourself finding something dramatically more artistically profound than your peers have? For example, I watch Takahashi Mike's box from the short film collection Three Extremes, and I huh. see expert cinematography and minimalist sound design driving one of the most subtle and emotionally compelling narratives I've ever seen. And my friends just see, well, let's be real, they don't watch foreign films at all. Right. Um, it's self-evident that your deep dives of games and other topics go well beyond the average Joe's perception of them, and that's one of the reasons why you guys are wonderful. Has the community ever made you feel those deep artistic perspectives are the norm? And do you ever find yourself thinking, wow, I really take this more seriously than most people? Um, so do you have a thought on that before I jump in? I, I, yes, I, yeah, um, (laughs) I do. I don't have a, like this happens to me a lot, I suppose, but it's kind of a thing that people get and maybe just as they get older, I don't have a ton to say on the subject, but I do think that I went to film school. So I've seen a lot of really abstract movies, really different, really a lot of old films. Um, And um, even some of the newer abstract, really good movies like, uh, Oh, who directed the thin red line? Oh, I forget. Oh, super, super famous director. Um, He made another movie. Terrence Malick. Oh, Terrence Malick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Malick made, uh, what was that big one he made? A Tree of Life. Yeah, Tree of Life is crazy. He made The Tree of Life. Now, I watched that movie movie with my family, right? My parents, (laughs) my brothers. My parents don't do those kind of art films. films. (laughs) Yeah, they don't do art films. And so at first I was like, oh, we got to see this Malik film. It's going to be awesome. I didn't realize how subtle and how emotional and how raw it was going to be, you know? And my initial reaction to watching that, despite the fact that I have this film theory background, (laughs) I was like, I didn't love the movie. I didn't really. And I'm probably the first person with a film degree that would say they didn't love the movie <laughs> that you'll ever meet in your life because they're all about that kind of stuff. And I really do like it. I, I I came to appreciate it later. And certain parts of it, I really do appreciate. But there's something about going to watch a movie because it's fun that this movie did not provide for me at all. And that I kind of felt embarrassed because I drugged these people along who usually oh, you went to just the watch theater. movies for fun. We went to an old like uh, an art house that uh, only plays either old films or art films. We, uh, it was not a wide release film, right? But we did see it in a theater in Denver. Uh, I think it's called the Littleton Art House or something like that. It's not a normal theater. <laughs> and so anyways, crazy stuff. They usually do like horror shows and they have, they have a lot of fun at that, at that theater. Um, but they don't ever show the new movies. They never show Transformers. They never show stuff like that. Right. But there is an element to the Transformers movies that makes them fun despite the fact that they aren't worth very much to your life. And then the movie Tree of Life, which has incredible value to your life, it just isn't very fun to watch. And so like, I, I actually do understand both sides of it. Um, I did find some of the people that I was around in my film school to be slightly annoying because of how into this kind of art stuff they were and how much they despised most of what Hollywood makes. Um, But they were still cool. I still liked everybody in my film school. But um, 
Yeah, I kind of see both sides of it. it and it kind of depends on what, what you're going for and what you're expecting out of it. Is it going to, are you looking for a fun experience or are you looking for some life altering, you know, artistic experience? And, you know, some people who just expect one thing and not the other, they're, I don't know, maybe they're just not very well rounded people. Um, but, in addition to that kind of stuff, CJ, I do just have to say that some fun movies are just fun. I watched Lion King with my daughter today, and that's good such movie. a well-done movie. Oh, my good gosh, that movie is so good. Mm-hmm. It is so well done, and and it's just fun and, and funny and interesting, and it's got all that stuff in it. But it's not necessarily a super artistic, you know, intricately woven story or anything. But geez, that movie's so good. And a lot of kids' movies, I, I really gravitate towards kids' movies because those to me seem the most genuine. And a lot of art films kind of shun that. And I don't know. There's so That's many things that say. you said that I want to comment on. I'll, I'll remember all of it. This one. I probably said too much. <laughs> this one, right off the bat. So I just played Suikoden. Oh, cool. And one of the things I appreciate the most about it is that it fits into that sort of. 90s animated disney or like pixar kind of Uh, thing where you can play that as a kid and it's amazing and then you can play it as adult and realize there's all these things in there that you wouldn't have picked up on as a kid like there is some heavy material in suikoden there's genocide and chemical warfare and Uh freaking like racism and patricide and like Mm. some heavy intense stuff but it is done in a tone that is so appropriate for kids. And the whole game is sort of like tailored, I feel, for like a new player of RPGs. It, it's like a perfect introduction to RPGs. It would be like the first game that I would have a ki- my kids play as an RPG to like help them learn what this oh, really? genre nice. is all about. Cool. But it's like, it's written for that age range, I feel, from like, you know, eight to maybe like high school age. Like, mm. the dialogue is written in a, in a style that's kind of tailored for that range of kids, I would say. But, like, you can still appreciate, like, the heavy concepts it's tackling as an adult. So, anyways, I just wanted to comment on that because that, that's what I love about the Disney animated films, especially the 90s ones like Lion King. Because yeah. um, there's heavy material in that, too. I mean, like, death. Oh, and, yeah. And, you know, all kinds of heavy stuff. But, like, kid, it's still okay for kids to watch that. They can handle it because it's done with the right tone. And, like, yeah. it's not too dark, right? Um, so, anyways. And then you were talking about um, the elitist uh, film students, right? I think that um, <laughs> yeah. anything... And this is kind of my answer to the question, too, right? Because... You, you're, you're talking about you get really into movies, CJ, and, and you're you're analyzing them from more of like an artistic perspective. Mm-hmm. And other people are just watching the movie for the story or whatever. And what I want to point out is that almost everybody has a thing that they get really into, you know, something that they really love and they study that thing and they try to master that thing themselves. You know, it's a hobby of theirs or maybe they turn it into their profession. Some Everybody has a thing in life that they really love and then they get really good at that thing and to anyone else who's not as into it they're gonna feel like oh like nobody cares about this like i do or nobody like thinks about this on the level that i do right Uh, i don't know like say somebody like gordon ramsay who's like a world famous chef right and the way he thinks about cooking and and baking and, and recipes and like that sort of thing you know I, I would eat something he makes and something that's made by, let's say, a far, like, maybe my mom or somebody who's not, like, a world-renowned sure. chef. And I'd be like, these are both delicious meals. But his his palate is so refined, yeah, right? And, and he's thought so much about it and he's put so much of his life and attention into that. He would know why my mom's meal actually sucks. And right, why... and he, he would <laughs> tell her, too. <laughs> yeah, right? And so... <laughs> Yeah. Anything that you really get into like that, um, you know, you're going to have this deeper appreciation for it than other people. And, and it kind of feels sad when you're trying to talk about it with those who aren't as into it as you and they're not appreciating it as much as you do. And it's like, but you don't realize how much more you would love this if you just like paid attention to these things. Right. And so, yeah, I mean, having started the the channel, 
um, and talk. Basically, the, the channel has served as a way to find other people who think the same way about these games and, and movies and stuff and novels that we do, right? We say things, people who think similarly like those things, they follow, and then a community builds of people who are like-minded and who right. think the same way. And so you start to think maybe a little bit, oh yeah, like everyone thinks this way, <laughs> right? But um, mm -hmm. no, you're reminded pretty quickly, especially if any of your videos go beyond kind of your initial audience. Yeah. Any video that, that starts like getting shared and, and that uh, ends up on YouTube recommended or something like that. Um, there are a lot of people who do not think as either as deeply on those particular things or who have very different opinions on them or think differently and they'll let you know about it and uh, they, they don't like what you have to say. So, um, but no, I, and, and when you were talking about with like kind of elitism, right? I still think mm. you're, you're right that it's very important to sort of have a, just a well-rounded, balanced life. Yeah. And some people can get so into one thing that it leads to resentment of things that are made differently or with a different purpose. Yeah. And they sort of tend to lose sight of the fact that Transformers was not meant to deliver the same, like, emotional, like, analytical message about life and about families and relationships as Tree yeah. of Life. So if you're looking for that in Transformers you're kind of doing it wrong and yeah. to criticize it for not having that is I think misplaced. So you have to sort of be able to step back and go like, I, if I'm not interested in this, I shouldn't see it at all. Um, or to say like, I'm going in here looking for some fun action and that's the part of it that I'm, that I'm there for to enjoy or whatever. And so not, not, Transformers is probably a bad example because Transformers, even among fans, just movie fans who just want to go see action, it is considered pretty bad. Like Rotten Tomato scores are really low on both sides <laughs> on some of those right. movies for the audience and the critics, I'm saying. But and, yeah, yeah. Marvel, Marvel Cinematic Universe movies like The Avengers is probably better. Those ones are more. But I yeah. will say the newest Transformers movie, the Bumblebee one. Oh, I haven't seen that. Yeah. Have you seen the Rotten Tomato score for it? Is it high? Yeah, it's freaking like 95. Yeah, they made a good one, <laughs> finally. <laughs> by far the highest rated Transformers movie ever made. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. you can have those kinds of movies. I mean, it, it's the same way with um, a lot of the classic blockbusters that I grew up with and loved, like, let's say, Jurassic Park, right? Mm -hmm. Like, Jurassic Park doesn't have some, like, deeper message, really. It's... Not really. If, if you want to think about chaos theory or life will find a way <laughs> and sort of, like, gerrymander that into, like, a deeper meaning if you want, sure, fine. Sure, sure. But... No, like the movie is about the rush of being hunted by <laughs> freaking like dinosaurs. What if dinosaurs were here today? <laughs> that's what it's about. And it's just like, holy <laughs> fetch, that's scary. It, and like, I hope these people get out, you know? It, it, it's fun to kind of go through that adventure. Well, it's not always fun. It's frightening, but you know what I mean. Um, it's exciting is what, I, is what I should say. So anyways, um, there's a place for both. And, uh, you know... Both can be done really well. And there will be some people who are going to look at Jurassic Park and break down its cinematography, and they're going to break down the acting. They're going to break down uh, the visual effects yeah. and how that dinosaur, like 30 years later, still looks, you know, better than most CGI people are doing today. And, and you know, they'll, they'll yeah. break down that side of it. And others will just go, holy crap, like I had a rush when that velociraptor came out of behind the, behind the uh, little hose the little wires and cords at, at her and she's like lipping out of the place but she got the power back up again and and yeah. uh guy i forget his name the character says clever girl on the raptor robert right? muldoon robert muldoon yeah. is such a beast and you know <laughs> yeah oh man that <laughs> like guy. that that side of it um is is what people will enjoy about it and you know both both can be good so yeah, um, I think so. Anyways. It is nice to have a community because there are, I mean, you got to be honest, there are less people that appreciate the art of art films yeah. than there are people who appreciate the action of action films. True. But obviously, yes. there's less people. <laughs> it's less common. And it is cool to have a group of people that think that way. What I don't like is only associating with that group of people, which it doesn't seem like you. It sounds like you've got friends that, you know, are clearly not involved in that in, but you've got to be you got to be in both worlds you can't just get into one because the people who get into just the art films tend to not be the funnest people to be around i've found yeah because if it if it leads to again resentment 
or like um, like a you despise anyone who's into this or, or you know, yeah. like this elitist attitude. It's, uh, I don't know, not tell people how to live, but no, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> it makes you insufferable to be around. Um, okay, let's move on to our last question. We'll finish up. This is when it. it comes to storytelling tropes, I've noticed that some of them tend to bother me more than others. I'm sure this is probably true for everyone. For example, tropes like the mentor character dies or the hero is transported to another world rarely bother me. I'm usually okay with these tropes as long as they serve their purpose in the story. However, other writing tropes like the designated comedy relief character, the impending danger was avoided just in the nick of time, or the true villain only revealed near the very end, I often find very annoying and lazy. Given that our preference yeah. for storytelling tropes vary from person to person, and also from culture to culture, how can we accurately judge if certain tropes are actually good or bad for a story? Is it even possible to make a judgment like that, or can we only criticize the execution or overuse of tropes specific to each story or genre? It's a tough question, uh, dude. McCoy. I say don't ever criticize... Well, uh, don't ever criticize the overuse of tropes. Um, that's a blanket, very... Strong statement, I suppose, but um, tropes are tropes for a reason. They they work. Humans identify with them, right? Humans believe with the way we live our lives and the way we observe the world somehow aligns with the tropes that are usually included in most stories that we watch. the The question is, how are they done, or how um, how are they executed? I think that is the one thing that you can criticize, but having the trope be there at all is not something I think you should criticize because it's a trope for a reason. I don't know if I don't even like the word trope that much, <laughs> um, but it's typically, and I'm talking about the bigger ones, not like the tiny tropes. Now you do bring up things like the designated comedy relief character. That is quite often annoying, right? But that all depends on how, it's executed on how on how it's done. If if it's annoying, that means that that character was featured too often, or that character is too much of a one sided person, which no one in our lives actually are one sided. Mm. Uh, everyone's got some depth to them. Everybody gets scared, or everybody stops joking at some point, right? And if you have in your movie where this person just never stops joking, that is annoying. That's an execution thing, though. You mm. always have. Um, people who take things more lightly than others or who are really witty and can think of something to say to lighten the mood more than other people. And, and that's normal. That's not a problem. The problem is Jar Jar Binks. <laughs> the problem <laughs> is, you know, when it's just stupid and, and the jokes aren't funny, you know, that's an execution thing. That's not, yeah. that's not the fault of the trope itself because comedy relief is important. You, it's really important to have that. I think one of the reasons I really like the return of the King and it's probably the darkest of all the films, especially as Frodo is approaching Mount doom, but that had so many lighthearted moments. There's so yeah. many parts where either Pippin or Gandalf is like, get up and he smacks Pippin on the head after Pippin swears an oath to the King or whatever, or, you know, just different parts where they're looking at each other and it's, it's funny, right? There's, there's some, there's some truly comedic parts. Um, you you need that in a story like The Return of the King because when you don't have that, you get... Okay, and this is actually a good movie, so I shouldn't bring this up as a bad example, but most <laughs> movies don't do it this well. I'll just say it that way. But did you guys see A Quiet Place? Did you see that, Mike? No, I want to see it, though. It's very, okay. very... It's like a Netflix really good. original, or yeah. was it... No, it was in no, theaters, no, wasn't it? Was it? Theaters. it was in theaters. Yeah. Um, okay. I don't know who made it, but John Cr Krasinski... John Krasinski, yeah, is yeah. the director, right? He directed and is the main actor. So good. I tell you what, it's a horror suspense film, right? Yeah. So... If that's what it's going for, then sure, the comedy relief is less Wouldn't important. Worked, but right. I don't recall basically any comedy relief in that whole movie. There may have been a couple, but I don't remember them. I that I've never had higher nerves, like higher blood pressure watching a movie than <laughs> it is so intense. And it's like I I had no relief. There was no relief the entire film. And and that was very nerve wracking for me. I, I didn't really like it. However, the movie was really good. And the mm -hmm. point of a suspense horror film is to make you uncomfortable. So it makes sense in certain instances to not have that. But for a general film that is to be consumed by a majority of people of all ages and genders and ethnicities and everything, um, 
something like Lord of the Rings or something like that. Um, you, it, it's super important to have comedic relief. So anyways, I would always criticize the execution of tropes, not the inclusion of them, not just the fact that yeah. they were there. Yeah, I, I, I have to agree. Um, and, and you says, uh, how can you accurately judge if certain tropes are actually good or bad for a story? Is it even possible to make judgments or can we only criticize the execution or overuse? I think it always comes down to how. How did you yeah. use it? Because we're at a point, and if anyone has not seen the series, Everything is a Remix, go freaking oh, yeah. watch that. That's can, a great it, there's, series. There's one on YouTube yeah. that has like the whole three parts or whatever put into one. I think the original is hosted on like Vimeo or something now, but um, mm -hmm. it is an excellent series that points out just how often we borrow. We borrow from what we're inspired by, from what we grow yeah. up with. And there's Which is nothing, what tropes are. It's something borrowed from the past. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's almost nothing that is truly original in yeah. storytelling anymore. And you're going to find, depending on your experience, and this is why people who are older generally tend to lay down criticism like, oh, that's ripped off of this. Or, oh, like, I've seen that before. Because... The, the more you've consumed, I guess, like the more stories you've seen or read or whatever, like the more you have repeated these tropes and the more you start to go like, eh, like I know what's going to happen now. Um, but it's it, like I have. OK, I'll bring this up. Right. So mm. when I announced when we announced that we were going to be reading through The Last Wish, the, the first Witcher novel. A lot, yeah. there was a lot more pushback than I imagined. And I know why it's because mostly we have gamers on this channel right? and yeah. gamers who love the Witcher video games are not happy with the author of the books because he's kind of a dick and he has shown yeah, a, a certain like lack of respect for video games because yeah. he's jealous. I would say it's pretty mm -hmm. clear that they have been more successful than his novels and that they've overshadowed mm -hmm. him a bit. And he has not been um, very grateful. He has not shown gratitude to the fact that those games have brought a lot more attention to his books. And he's tried yeah. to deflect and say, like, no, uh, their success was because of me as much as my success is because of them. And it's just not a lot of humility in the man. He's not a very likable person. Yeah. However, he writes really, really good books. It um, actually was very good. You guys should read it. <laughs> so yeah. one thing that tends to happen when you have a, a a figure like that that is not a likable person, and, and if he's offended people who are into video games, right, they tend to be a bit more hostile in their criticism of that person I have seen. So mm -hmm. lots of people were laying on that and being like, he's a plagiarist um, of, mm -hmm. of Eric um, Morcock. Mor Hold on. I have, I have a page here. I'm going to bring it up. I've never heard of this. Um, he's he's a fantasy author who wrote a character. Let me bring it up. I actually have it here. I'm going to bring up like the Wikipedia page on it. Uh, is his character it? named Gerald? No, but he is an albino with white hair who has a nickname of White Wolf. Oh, well, that's interesting. <laughs> okay, so let me let me let me put all the context to this. I need I didn't plan on this. I would have had this all up. Now, now Elric to go, is like, what you're talking about. Elric. Elric. But the, 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 the author is Moorcock, right? That's his last name. I, I'm, again, this is like the 1,000th example of me having just the worst memory of all time with names. I just cannot remember <laughs> names for some reason. It's just in one That's ear, funny. out the other. It doesn't matter how much I hear it. I can't freaking remember. Hmm. Um, let, me, let me find my, uh, my page for this. Okay, hold on. I'm just going to bring up Elric... of Melnabone is is the character uh, michael moorcock is the name of the author okay so okay. his character is a white-haired albino sorcerer who uses alchemy nicknamed white wolf and at the surface level you go what the fetch Geralt is a complete ripoff of this character right however you then look into Michael Moorcock himself and where his influence came from. Listen to this. Moorcock acknowledges that the work of Beltrot Brecht, particularly Three Brecht. Penny Novel 
and the Three Penny Opera as one of the chief influences for the initial Eric sequence. He dedicated yeah. 1972's Elric of Melibonne to Brecht. In the same dedication, he cited Paul Anderson's Three Hearts and Three Lions and Fletcher's Pratt's the well-known of the unicorn as similarly influential texts. There's actually a quote here. It's really good. Um, El Elric's al albinism appears to be influenced by Monsieur Zenith, an albino Sexton Blake villain whom Moorcock appreciated enough to write into the latter multiverse stories. So wow. he took Sexton Blake's character, Monsieur Zenith, and wrote that character into his multiverse story he released later. Moorcock read Zenith's stories in his youth, and has attributed to their and uh, and has contributed to their later reprinting, remarking that it took me forty years to find another copy of Zenith the Albino. In fact, it was a friend who found it under lock and key and got a copy of it. Uh, and he says, "At last, about we're about to reprint it. Why I have spent so much energy making public the evidence of my vast theft of Anthony Skinney, I'm not entirely sure." <laughs> Okay, this happens huh. all of the time. You know, people yeah. are influenced by what they read as kids, yep. and they work that into what they're writing, and they borrow and copy from each other. But the key is, it's not plagiarism if you can work it into something that and make it your own. And that's the way tropes yeah. work in storytelling. You're going to have your mentor character who dies appear in many, many stories. You're going to have the saved in the nick of time trope appear in many stories. The villain, not, the real villain not being re, uh, revealed until the very end. It's all about how you do it. And, and the execution is what we're getting at here. It's all about the execution, man. <laughs> whether or not it works and yeah. whether or not it feels cheesy and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But there is nobody in the universe who is not writing something based on something they've been inspired by and that elements of that are going to show up in their own stuff. Yeah. Everyone does it. Every freaking one does it. There's no exceptions. It's just that you didn't know about Monastir Zenith, but you did know about Elric of uh, Melon Bone or whatever. I can't pronounce the freaking name. You knew about that character, so you're like, oh, plagiarist fetch uh andre sokovsky never read his stuff blackmail no, not blackmail uh, uh blacklist like boycott, boycott yeah. this yeah. guy he's a plagiarist and the guy you're talking about he's plagiarizing plagiarized and admitted to plagiarizing no, it's not really plagiarism but anyways no it's just borrowing it's just for the purpose borrowing. of telling a story there's nothing wrong with that everyone does it everyone so yeah you're never gonna find a story that is truly original. You're just not going to find it. So it's about the execution. That's what I'm getting at. The end. Mm. <laughs> the end. Thank you for watching. Execution. <laughs> All right, guys. Mm. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Miss Monet, yeah, there's a cool. book called Steal Like an Artist. She got an yeah. Amazon link here. Let's pull it up. Hey, if you guys want to know an artist, contemporary artist, that basically does nothing but steal and is incredibly famous, Look into Beyonce. <laughs> Look into <laughs> herself and what she ad herself admits. She talks about this. Somebody, I remember she went to a smaller artist. Uh, every artist is smaller than her. but <laughs> She's freaking huge. But she went to some smaller artist show and somebody asked her, what are you there for? And she goes, I'm here looking for ideas for my own show. And mm. it's like, whoa, she's just out. She's open about it. She's like, yeah, I steal other people's stuff and I make it my own. And that's sort that's what art is in a mm. lot of ways. You know, it's like you make it your own and however you do that is up to you. But art is using the stuff around you to make something new. Um, Gliding Falcon is saying apparently the main theme of Metal Gear Solid was plagiarized, but I was actually going to bring up Snake himself huh. is basically Snake uh, Pliskin from Escape from New York. It's oh, like really? the same dude. Eye patch, long that. hair, like hates the government. It's like it used to be a soldier, but like it's, it's more big boss than it is Solid Snake. But still, right. uh, he, uh, <laughs> Kojima watched movies growing up. He loves movies. That's why his games are basically just long movies with like a sprinkle yeah. of gameplay in there sometimes. <laughs> He's a huge Rambo. film yeah. buff and he loved Escape from New York. And so he made oh. Metal Gear Solid based on Snake Plissken. It's wow. so obvious. <laughs> like this happens all the time. Uh, freaking um, 
people love Xenogears, right? Xenogears is just a mis like a just an amalgamation of uh uh um freaking uh psychoanalytical figures like uh who's the guy we talked about the other week? Jung. Jung. Carl Jung and and Freudian concepts. Freud. And and he takes yeah. a character straight out of childhood's end and just like names the character the same character. Now it was eventually translated as Corellian in English, but it's supposed to be Corellan, straight up Corellan from childhood's end. Same character name. Like this happens all the time. And so if you're going to be be consistent at least. If you're going to say, don't read The Witcher because it's plagiarized, then don't play Metal Gear Solid. Don't play Xenogears. Don't Watch Star Wars. <laughs> Don't basically watch or read anything because all of it's been freaking it's stolen. It's from all you only read before. the originals, like uh, what the Canterbury Tales, Beowulf, yeah. and even those are based on stories that have been told for tens of thousands of years. So you just can't. I'm sorry, it doesn't exist. There is no originality. It's it's, it's no matter literally how far back you everywhere. Go. And and it's just the fact that are you aware? Are you aware of the influences? If you research the influences, you'll see them. Yeah. Um, but if you're not aware of them, then you'll, it'll feel original to you, right? And the younger you are, the less you know about older stuff that you watched 50 years ago. It's like, oh, that came from that, and that came from that, and that came from that. But it happens all the time. Uh, I, would, I would challenge anyone out there, and I'm sure there are some examples. I'm not saying there's no originality whatsoever. There are definitely some innovations happening, but those will eventually be borrowed, and then they become mainstream too. Right. But if you can think of completely original stories being released in the modern day that have no influences obvious influences that have been borrowed from and that i i won't be able to research and find them share them with me i'll watch them and discuss them on a future podcast okay i think we're done for today all right thank you everybody for watching you guys are Thanks great for watching we will be back again uh, next we all well, on two no no Tuesday is New Year's so we're not going to yeah. do book club this week we're no doing book, book club. club the week after that but yeah. we are reading Miss Born it's really good I really like it I'm stoked to talk about it um, and the we'll see you again next Sunday for the next podcast so till then have a great week have a great New Year hope you all had a great Christmas yep peace out.